Uh, uh, Christopher Cannon from uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. I cannot pronounce the name of the drug of the trial, so I'm just going to introduce Chris and let him take it on from there. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I'll be the first of three uh, presentations from the Odyssey program that study uh, the efficacy and safety of alirocumab. Um, which is a PCSK9 inhibitor that modulates cholesterol. This study was done in high cardiovascular risk patients who are inadequately controlled uh, for their uh, hypercholesterolemia despite maximally tolerated statins. And this study is called Odyssey Combo 2. And it's on behalf of the co-authors and the steering committee, several uh, <coughs> members of the company, and the investigators who I'll show at the very end um, that um, have the privilege to share these uh, results with you. Um, these are the disclosures for all of uh, the co-authors as listed. So the design of the study begins on, on the left here with patients at high cardiovascular risk. And so um, I don't have the baseline characteristics, but 92% of this group had known coronary heart disease. The others had multiple risk factors. And uh, despite maximally tolerated statins, um, their LDL was above 1.8 millimole per liter or 70 milligram per deciliter. Um, and the few percent above 100 if they had risk factors. So patients were randomized on top of statins again to, in a two-to-one fashion, receive alirocumab uh, or an active control, in this case azetamibe, 10 milligrams, which is our only available uh, add-on therapy for, for LDL lowering. So alirocumab is given uh, subcutaneously every two weeks, and in this study we began with a 75 milligram dose every two weeks. Then uh, there was the potential to increase that dose on the basis of LDL, and this was checked at week eight, and then if the LDL were still above 70, uh, increased to 150 at the week 12 uh, time point. This is the pre-specified uh, efficacy analysis, includes safety data. Um, the trial is a two-year total trial, and this is the analysis specified after one year of availability or 52 weeks uh, of, of data. So this is the primary endpoint. Um, as shown in yellow, there was a 50% reduction in LDL when adding alirocumab on top of maximally tolerated statins. Um, this comprised of 18% of the group required up titration, uh, and so 80% or so on that starting dose. In the active comparator, Zetamib reduced LDL by about 20%, and then the difference, highly sig significant uh, difference in the um, amount of LDL lowering. Uh, this slide depicts the changes over time and the absolute cholesterol levels that were achieved, and you can see very rapid uh, reduction in, in LDL and sustained reduction out through one year of follow-up, with the achieved levels being at 1.3 and 1.4, uh, or about just above 50 milligram per deciliter um, as the mean LDL is, is plotted here. Um, and this obviously is highly statistically significant relative to uh, azetamod. Now for the safety data, um, there was a balance of the treatment emergent adverse events um, and in SAEs. You'll see uh, amongst some of the AEs between these three presentations, there are numeric differences that one might say, oh, wait a minute, but you'll see that anything shows here doesn't show in the next one, and so here we have a lower number of deaths, uh, equal number of neurocognitive, and slightly higher number of ALT elevations, but you'll see that it's on balance all equal. Um, and so CK elevations, myalgias, uh, and other typical statin-related effects were not different between alirocumab and azetamib. And so in conclusion, we studied the high-risk patients, and these would be patients who met the current ACCHA guidelines on maximally tolerated statins, 
uh, but who hadn't reached their LDL goal, where adding therapy in this design of treating to a target, in this case of less than 70, uh, we were able to uh, get 77% of the patients below that target with a 51% reduction in LDLC uh, that was sustained out through one year of treatment. I should note that this is an injection of a 1 ml injection that patients did themselves at home every two weeks, and uh, they were able to do this at the end of the year. 85% of people were doing this um, per the protocol. Um, and uh, as noted, the adverse events looked very comparable. And so um, I want to thank you for part one of this three-part series. So thank you very much. Data, um, it's open to questions. Dr. Cannon, Ed Sussman with uh, uh, MedPage today. Um, in your conclusion, you say 77% achieved LDL um, goal um, with um, the new Ali drug. Rakimab, yeah. Ali Rakimab, did I say it right? Yeah. Close. Um, what was the percentage that achieved that goal with azetamide? Uh, so not shown, I'll show at the sessions of 45% got less than 70. Um, looking at uh, less than 50, it was 60% and 15%. Um, were were they both so. statistically significant? Uh, yes, yeah, so okay. all differences uh, highly different. Mm -hmm. We'll have, likely in the paper, the full sort of waterfall plot is the current distribution where you see all of the curves, and so they start like this and goes like this. Um, and um, the patients were, took, were injected themselves every two weeks. Did you remind them to inject themselves, or did, were, did you just say, here's the stuff, go inject yourself every two weeks and never talk to them again? Um, there were visits, let me see if I go, uh, sorry. There were visits every uh, three months, I believe, and so certainly reinforced with the coordinators at that point of instructions, et cetera. But this was done on their own in between the, the so, study visits. So they didn't have a nurse call them up at, at two weeks and say, you know, it's time for your injection. No, and, and I think that has been one of the things that certainly for cholesterol managed, the notion of injections is foreign. Uh, that was one of the big surprises to all of us to say that patients really did this. I think in part because the cholesterol lowering is so dramatic that you know they you know could see these type results and say, well, okay, this seems worth it. And so that's been a, a very pleasant surprise. But you know, this is a, a field that will move on very quickly with apps and iPhones and various automatic reminders that go uh, go out to patients. I mean. It's a good point you made, though. Lynn Peterson with Trends in Medicine. So the inject injection device, is this sort of similar to the insulin pen? Or is this a totally different device? Or I believe, I don't have one here. Uh, and yeah. Same. Uh, so small, it's a 1 ml injection, so it's a pretty small amount. Um, I see there was someone in the second row. I don't know if we... Hi, I'm Michael Reardon with theheart.org. Um, maybe this question is best left until after three, or if you want to answer it now. I was just wondering how comfortable the physicians are with um, you know, LDL being a surrogate endpoint. There's been a lot of criticism about azetamide, you know, having no outcomes data yet. And just a second question is related to, if you could speculate, how safely do you, th how, how low do you think you could possibly go safely in this sort of population? So excellent question. I think LDL is of surrogates in medicine probably the best surrogate we have in that there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of patients randomized and, and the, the lower we go, the lower the event rates that, that have been seen. I think uh, obviously Janet was vice chair of the new guidelines that de-emphasized that as a target and emphasized the evidence base of using high dose or maximally tolerated statins. So probably both are true. Uh, and so the evidence-based guideline emphasizing statin use is the first 
uh, evidence, but then we as physicians, and certainly the next presentation, you'll see sky-high LDLs that are now being able to be brought down. And so um, that's obviously the first target of and the pharmacologic effect of the drug. So measuring this is obviously important, but using it as a target, um, ultimately we need to see the cardiovascular outcomes with this class or any class of drugs. Um, but probably both are important, of both LDL and the outcomes. Um, and for ezetimibe, we'll have those outcome data finally at the AHA. So. There, Are there any more questions? Yeah. I'm from a Dutch uh, doctor's med, uh, magazine. Just a figure question about what part of patients do we talk? Uh, how, uh, what person to percentage of uh, high CV risk patient does not reach the uh, normally the LD, low LDLC? This is an excellent question and one to come from uh, trials. Actually, within the Durapolitib study, I was involved uh, from SOLID where we actually tracked what percentage. So there, of our patients where we reminded them to please use high dose statins, only 40% of post ACS patients who had an LDL less than 70. So 60% were not at goal, despite being in a trial with trialists who think lipids are important uh, in tracking this. So large percentages of, of people still aren't at the, the low targets that are recommended. In this study, um, you had to be on maximally tolerated statins, so the U.S. guidelines, so two-thirds, uh, I'll show in the main session, were on the high-dose statins, and then the other third all had clear documentation that was verified of reasons that they had tried high-dose statins but couldn't tolerate it for one of several reasons. Um, and so they're trying the best despite that having high LDLs, um, and so looking for what could be the next add-on therapy. Let's um, move on. I think we'd also make the point that in outside a trial setting in clinical practice, if you look at patients being treated with chronic stable angina, a much lower percentage are at an LDL of 70. So the trial population is even higher than the, in clinical practice.